Hey now, um, here we are, back to uh, chapter 14. Hopefully you uh, you went out, went for a walk, went for a jog, took a nap, are feeling well rested, and are ready to uh, to push ever onwards into this uh, fun land of statistics. So the next few chunks of slides are going to talk about outliers in, in assumption checking. This particular chunk of slides is focused entirely on outliers. But one thing to keep in mind is both of these things are what we would refer to as model dependent. So everything we talked about in the previous set of slides, we said is like good standard practice for like any set of data, no matter what you're doing with it. That is, we hadn't even really talked about like building a model. Now we are talking about a model. So here, when I'm using this phrase outlier, I'm referring to an outlier relative to a model. Here, when I'm talking about assumptions, I'm talking about assumptions relative to a model. So all, all of what we're talking about now assumes that we're in the context of some model, which of course we've spent I mean, pretty much the entirety of, of this class talking about models, so nothing unusual um, or crazy there. However, next lecture, we're going to really um, kind of roll up our sleeves and uh, get to the hard work of uh, model building. Now, not only all right, are these model dependent, right, well, they're we're going to see, and we're going to kind of reinforce this in the next slide, I think, that they are addressed through that model's residuals. So, so outliers and assumption checking are based on residuals. Residuals are functions of some model. Right, so here's the definition. Remember, right, from an earlier class, the residual is defined as the difference between an observed value of y and its predicted value. y minus y hat, observed minus predicted. And again, the idea of predicted is implying a model, right? It's a model that's doing the prediction. We can't have a residual without a predicted model, without a predicted value. We can't have a predicted value without a model. Residuals are model dependent. So for some given model, we have a set of residuals. Now, when we think of a residual as being observed minus predicted, well, what's, what's subtraction? Subtraction is a distance operator. So the residual is essentially measuring how far the actual observed value was from the value our model predicted it should be, right, based on a set of explanatory variables, which implies what? It implies that, that the larger an outlier is, right, an absolute value, the stronger the indication that that particular observation deviates from what the model predicts. Large outliers means the observed value was far from what the model predicted it would be. Anytime we see something like that, that should be what to us? That should be a red flag. That should be something that, that catches our attention. That should be something that warrants further inspection. <clears throat> Why? Well, like before, high residuals, again, talking in terms of absolute value, can be indicators of data entry errors. They can um, be observations that were not part of our intended population. So it becomes like a secondary data cleaning step. And then, and, the, and this varies from problem to problem, from context to context, is limited only by our ability to fathom and understand and think critically through a problem could mean a whole bunch of other things, right? So consider an example um, where we have the owner of a used car lot. 
he might flag extreme sales to see if his employees have been giving good deals to friends. So let's think about this. Let's think about this in a few ways. If, if, if this owner is interested in um, catching employees who are giving good deals to their friends, that means he's interested in only either positive or negative. Which one do you think that that means he's interested in? I have to actually stop and think about this. So let's let's think about it together. I have to I have to stop talking to actually think. You may or may not have a brain that functions the same way. Uh, so I'm turning off mouth. I'm engaging brain. Is it going to be a positive or negative residual? Yeah, it should be negative, right? So if if, if um, in the situation, the car is selling for less than it should be, right? Think of like the extreme situation. It's like they're giving it away for free, so it's selling for zero dollars, whereas it should have sold for say ten thousand dollars. In that case, the residual is the observed zero minus the expected ten thousand. That's a negative ten thousand dollars. So, right in this example, right, the owner might look at a bunch of negative residuals might look at like the really extreme negative residuals and might see if all of those extreme negative residuals all belong to the same salesperson. Right, which could mean that that salesperson is, um, is, is cheating the company. Could just mean that the salesperson um, is just sort of being duped, is not a good negotiator. Either way, right, there probably should be some sort of intervention from the owner. So again, we could look at something bad and see if like these incidents of badness are sort of concentrated in a certain area, right, in this example, a certain salesperson, and then that might give us something actionable that we might do. Now, what's the problem? It's a problem that occurs again and again and again, right? Deja vu all over again in statistics. We talk about this idea of a large residual means this, or when I see a large residual, I should do that. But again, how do we define the idea of large? Right, when we're talking about like really, really, really esoteric units like, uh, like subterranean triglycerides, if I told you the subterranean triglycerides was 0.725 grams per cubic ounce, is that large? Is that not large? Pff, I don't even know what a subterranean triglyceride is, let alone what a large amount of it means. But even in like more mundane units, it ranges from problem to problem, doesn't it? A residual of five pounds, is that a lot? Well, if we're talking about like measuring the weight of hamsters, a residual of five pounds is probably astounding. If we're measuring elephants, a residual of five pounds is probably like nothing at all. So like not only is it tough to get an idea of what large means, right? This idea of large could vary from problem to problem. So how do we how do we get around this as as statisticians, but probably not subject specialists. Well, the same solution we always use in statistics. Instead of looking at the residual, we look at the standardized residual, sometimes referred to as the studentized residual. That is, we take the residual and we divide it by the standard deviation. In this example, the standard deviation is the square root of the MSE. Remember from a previous lecture, the MSE is the best guess for that conjectured common variance, right? We, our homogeneity assumption is that, right, uh, the error for any observation um, are all the same. And so the estimate of this common variance sigma squared is MSE, right? So the square root of the variance, right, would be the standard deviation. So we take all the errors, we divide by their standard deviations, right? Now this what? It converts it from, from units of subterranean triglycerides, whatever that is, it almost sounds like something I made up, 
to units of standard deviations, right? And even though we as statisticians don't know what these technical units are or mean, we absolutely know what standard deviations are. You tell me a difference is five standard deviations, I, I stand up and take attention. I say, wow, that's something we need to look into. All right, empirical rule tells us, right, anything really more than two standard deviations is like a little bit unusual, right? Empirical rule says, again, assuming normal distribution or normal-ish distribution, 95% of the time, we should be within two standard deviations of a mean. Um, sorry, sorry, the previous slide, I said studentize that. Formula from the previous slide is standardized residuals. We also have two other types of residuals. Um, the first one is called studentized residuals. So here we're gonna use uh, notation R, R sub I. Notice it, it does look very, very similar, doesn't it? To um, to the residuals, the standardized residuals from before. The only difference is we add in that denominator the square root of one minus H. Um, H is referred to as the leverage of observation I. In a few slides, we'll talk in more detail about what the leverage is. For now, just right, there's this extra factor and that extra factor goes into our formula. Now we could take that studentized residual, we could tweak it just a little bit more, we could improve upon it just a little bit more by creating something called the jackknife residual. The formula looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? It's just that subscript is different. That subscript has these minus i's in it. Those minus i's are suggestive as to how we calculate this jackknife residual. And, oh man, this is where my, my poor aging brain is failing me. I hope that the next slide goes into greater detail about the jackknife residual. I'm gonna, I'm gonna page to the next slide and hope that I'm right. And so I'll defer kind of defining what's going on with that jackknife residual um, for that slide. Um, oh, all right. Actually, let's, let's talk big picture. So first off, like why, why are we taking something that's really intuitive, um, right? What's really intuitive is the standardized residual and why are we like making it a little less intuitive by putting this, this square root of one minus H in the denominator? Well, again, we've kind of seen this thing before. Even though this particular formula is less intuitive, it turns out that we can show mathematically that adding this, this, this square root of one minus H in the denominator allows us to prove that it now follows a particular distribution. In fact, we could show mathematically that the studentized residuals, right? If we add that square root of one minus H, at that quantity, follows a t distribution with n minus k minus one, n's our sample size, k is our number of variables in the model, degrees of freedom. Similarly, the jackknife residuals follow a t distribution with n minus k minus two degrees of freedom. And knowing the degrees, or knowing the distribution, allows us to calculate probabilities, right? More particularly or more specifically p-values. And so now, well, it's not actually done very often in practice. It does allow us, if we were to want to, calculate p-values to very, very precisely quantify how unusual or how rare a particular outlier is. So why, why do we use these, um, studentized or jackknife residuals instead of the standardized because these residuals follow a t distribution and by following a known distribution we can calculate p values to quantify their rarity
So here we go. Going back to those formulas, in particular the jackknife, because we're going to see in a slide or two the, the, the general recommendation of all the various residuals, which one should we use? The recommendation is going to be to use the jackknife residual. So what is this thing? Well, remember that jackknife residual, right? It was just the, the actual raw residual divided by the standard deviation and that square root of one minus H, but it had that like minus I. What does that minus I mean? So the minus I is kind of just describing what, what I've written out here. The jackknife residual for, for some observation I is the studentized residual calculated using all observations other than that ith observation. That makes sense? So, I want to do the jackknife residual for the first observation. What, is, what does that mean? It means that I fit a model using observations two through n. I do not use the first observation. I hold that out. I fit a model using all the other observations, and then I look at I I I look at the residual between my withheld observation, observation one, and then what I would predict it to be based on the model I just fit. And then I withhold the second observation. I build a model using observations one and three and four and all the others, not number two. And then I look at the residual for observation two relative to this model. And then I hold that observation three and I fit a model using observations one and two and four and five and all of the others. And I look at the residual between observation three and this model. And I do that for all of them. Now, I guess this is our first concept check. This can, in theory, be computationally intensive. Why? Because this is our first concept check. This should make sense to us. If you understand the process that I'm describing, this requires SAS to fit in models. So if I had 100 observations, SAS is fitting 100 models. Now, all of these models are like very, 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 very close to one another. They're all extremely close to each other, but they are slightly different. And so SAS is fitting, is building 100 slightly different models to compute these 100 jackknife residuals. Does that process make sense? It's a little, it's a little bit, it's conceptually tricky, but it's important. It's important to understand what it is. And then we'll talk a little bit in the next slide why it is. I'm doing my best to talk it through, but this is definitely one of those things where being able to interact with the classroom and do a little bit of question and answer, draw a few pictures on a whiteboard definitely helps. I have added a graphic we'll see in the next slide, so I'll, I'll do what I can. But I, if you don't understand this, I don't want you to gloss over it. I want you to read in our textbook. They describe it well. Maybe even do some Googling. I'm sure there's a Wikipedia page on jackknife residuals. Right? Don't, don't just kind of wave this off. Hold yourself accountable one way or another. Maybe it's sending me an email. Right? Make sure you understand what these jackknife residuals are. And, and just as importantly, why we are doing this. Yeah, so why are we doing this? Good question, PowerPoint. Okay, so remember, our, out, our, our outliers are what? They're trying to help us detect anomalies, right? Points that are outside of a pattern. So look, look at this... Um, Look at this graphic. What do we see? Uh, looks like uh, looks like ten points. Yeah, ten points. 
it looks like nine of those ten points are pretty much all on like a perfect line, doesn't it? That is, it looks like I could, now notice SAS did not, but it looks like I could actually draw a line that would pretty much hit every one of those nine points. Now, we also have that 10th point, right? That 10th point is like way up there. Now, what's happening? We, we, we've known this. We've talked about this. Even though we could draw a line that would hit all nine points, the line of best fit is not that line, is it? Because why? Because that point up high is pulling the line upwards. Agreed? It's pulling that line towards it. It's exerting an inordinate amount of gravitational pull. It is pulling that line up towards it and away from all of the other points. Do we, do we see that? Now, why do we care? We care. <coughs> oh, pardon me. I actually, I promise you, A, I don't have the coronavirus. B, even if I did, I don't think it can spread to you through microphone and speakers. Um, I, I, in fact, I guess am recovering from, I, I no longer even have this, but I did have pneumonia. I'm not sure if that's better or worse than a coronavirus. Um, so there may be some coughing throughout these PowerPoints, and I apologize. Um, anyways, back to this line, right? So, so the, the the, the one point up top is pulling the line towards it. Now remember, the residual is the distance between that point and the line. Now that point up top is definitely an outlier, agreed? It's glaringly an outlier. But because it's pulling that line towards it, it has the ability to sort of diminish its residual, agreed? And in situations not as extreme as this one, it may be able to diminish it just enough to hide itself from whatever process we're using to find it. Hopefully that's an intuitive idea. So how do we get around this kind of, this kind of unfortunate fact that outliers distort our model, they pull the model towards them, and by doing so, reduce their residual, perhaps below whatever threshold we're using to find them, right? That is, these outliers have the ability to hide themselves. How do we, how do we unravel that, that, that insidious defensive mechanism? Well, what we would basically do is we would fit this line using the nine points that fall on the line and excluding that point up top, which looks like it corresponds to a four. An X, or I, I called it T for time, a time of four. Does that make sense, right? So imagine if we were to fit a line using only points one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now the line would actually hit all of those points, wouldn't it? And at the same time, that line would be farther from our point up top, meaning that that point up top would have a larger residual. This would be that point's jackknife residual. Does that help? Again, I know it's it's a tricky concept. It's it's hard to describe. It's a little hard to wrap your head around. But I promise you, once you do, it, it's 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 somewhat simple, and hopefully intuitive. So meditate on it, think it through. Hopefully, what I'm saying makes sense. If not, read the textbook. Consult Google. Send me an email. Now, another concept check. With this in mind, 
If this bullet point makes sense to you, you're in good shape. If it doesn't make sense to you, then I want you to keep thinking, keep meditating, keep reflecting until it does make sense. The N minus K minus one degrees of freedom for the studentized residual is actually the same thing as the N minus K minus two degrees of freedom for the jackknife residuals. Does that make sense? Because you could almost think of it as, instead of N minus K minus two, think of it as N minus one. minus k minus one. So that the difference is only that the studentized have an n for that first number and the jackknife have an n minus one. And that makes sense, right? Because remember, if I have a hundred observations, the jackknife residual is withholding one of those observations, right? So my n is no longer 100 my n is 100 minus 1 right it's not using a hundred observation it's using 99 observations so you could think of that first thing as like a hundred minus k minus 1 because studentized residuals aren't doing this extra process of withholding an observation and you can think of that second one as right 99 minus k minus 1 where that 99 is what that 99 is a is an n minus 1 i know it, it, there's a lot of like n's and k's and ones when I, when i try to verbalize it it gets obscured by like by these like by these symbols and these abstractions but that is an important point and i really think that you could measure how well you understand by whether or not this paragraph makes sense to you Now, of all the residuals we talked about, the standardized, the studentized, the jackknife, in this computationally powerful day and age, the general recommendation is to use jackknife residuals when hunting for outliers, because as we talked about with that graph, the jackknife residuals kind of get around this, 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 um, this, this undesirable property where outliers can sort of hide themselves by distorting our model. All right. Um, with, with that behind us, let's go ahead and do an example. We're actually gonna use this example in kind of all the other um, chunks of PowerPoints for this larger diagnostic discussion. Um, I believe you've seen this data set before in STAT 511. Um, I'll try to remember to post it on D2L if you want to play around with it. Um, it's the serial data set. And in this serial data set, um, the goal, I believe it's a real life data set, the goal was for the nutritionist who had the data set. Um, that nutritionist wanted to see whether they could use um, the amount of carbohydrates, the amount of sugar, and the amount of fat in um, cereals to predict their calories and then it had uh, 77 different cereals so we can generate output and look at residuals with the following code right so there's our proc reg specify what data set we want to use there's our model statement Right, calories is our y variable, carbs, fats, and sugars are our x variables. Now, if I want to output these residuals, I can use the output statement. We should be familiar with the output statement from, I know at least one of our labs has used it. We're gonna probably, we're gonna, we're gonna use the output statement a lot in this kind of overall diagnostic discussion. So the output statement will create an out, an, a new data set, an output data set, you can call it whatever you want. You, you name it through the out equal statement. So here I'm calling the, the output data set new data. And then I can output a bunch of stuff. Um, I can output the predicted value. So I use the keyword P, so P equals pred. That's gonna create a variable called pred that is essentially the predicted values. 
I could output just the raw residuals using the residual keyword. Um, the um, jackknife residuals, I use the keyword R student. And the studentized residuals, I can use the keyword student. I could also output that standard deviation, right? That's that denominator by uh, using the um, the STDR. It's actually the, the studentized standard deviation. So it's that standard deviation uh, times the square root of that one minus H. And then, so that allows me to output the residuals. And then I can examine them, right? So there's lots of ways of examining them. Right here, I started with just a basic proc print. All right, so that's what my proc print looks like. So, right, I have all these different cereals, right? Number 30, for example, is Fruity Pebbles. Number 54 is Product 19. That sounds kind of like, sounds like something right out of the lab, doesn't it? Products 1 through 18 weren't nearly a good enough for our consumers, but... Right after years of exhaustive research, we're proud to bring to you product 19. Uh, anyways, um, right for any one of these observations, let's go back to Fruity Pebbles, a little less laboratory-esque. We can see um, that Fruity Pebbles actually had 110 calories. Our model predicted it would have 116 calories. In this case, that means the residual is negative 6, right? The observed 110 minus the predicted 116 is negative six that standard deviation is 9.319 right we can get the studentized residual by doing that negative six divided by uh, nine right so nine over three is right about two-thirds or sorry six over nine six over nine um, is two-thirds negative two-thirds right because we have a negative six and then there's the jackknife. Now notice the jackknife's pretty close to the studentized. Often it is, which makes sense, right? Especially for larger data sets, holding out one observation, it'll change the model a little bit, but not a lot. So it's going to change the studentized residual a little bit, not a lot. Where it's changed the most is, right, the situations where we have these potential outliers. Okay, so we have these things outputted, so what? Well, again, right, we're looking for extreme residuals. So we could proc sort them and use proc print. That's one way to find the most extreme. This is one of those situations, right, where I remember in the previous slide, I talked about looking at the five largest, five smallest. This is actually a situation where looking at the five largest and five smallest is actually like a pretty nice... Um, a pretty nice strategy. And it turns out we can look at the five largest and five smallest really easily using proc unit variate. Proc unit variate, I think by default shows us those. So that is we can just kind of run these jackknife residuals through proc unit variate. A nice but kind of kind of coarse rule of thumb is that jackknife residuals with an absolute value larger than two which would correspond to roughly an alpha of 0.05 might warrant further scrutiny, right? So um, remember these jackknife residuals are still essentially, you know, it's, it's not perfectly because you still have that square root of one minus H, but it's close to, again, this idea of standardized. So it's like number of standard deviations. So, right, statistically, we often think if something's two or more standard deviations, Right, that's that's a large amount of standard deviations. So, right, a kind of broad rule of thumb is that the jackknife residuals are either right more than two or less than negative two. Right, we should we should examine them. Is this a data entry error? Does this person actually belong in our study? Does the value need to be changed? If not, then we would keep it. Now again, right, right. This is this is again. This is this is. These are just like broad strategies, okay? They're not gospel. There's not a lot of gospel in statistics. As statisticians, we want to be free thinkers. As statisticians, we want to be critical thinkers. 
as statisticians, we want to be flexible. It's nice, it's nice to have maybe some guidelines, some strategies, some rules of thumb, some conventions. But we never want to like become like so rigid that we're just like mindlessly, thoughtlessly always doing the same thing, right? This two is like a good rule of thumb, but there's a lot of arbitrariness to it. And and again, it's not a Bible, it's not a law. We're not going to go to jail if we do something a little bit different. And we might do something different, right? If we had like a really large data set. Why? Well, remember, like if that's an alpha of 0.05, it's basically saying that like 5% of the time we're going to get values that are larger than 2, but still perfectly fine. Now, what does that mean? It means that if we had like a thousand observations, 5% of a thousand is 50. That means that, I hope that's right. That means that we would expect to have 50 red flags that are like false red flags that are essentially wastes of our time. And again, this will vary from problem to problem, but if it's a la very laborious process to like track down an observation and see whether or not it's a data entry error, then maybe we want to use a more rigorous rule of thumb if we simply don't have the time to check, right, that sort of expected 50 values that will be beyond that that threshold of two. Maybe instead, right, for a much larger data set, maybe we use a rule of three. Okay. So again, a good rule of thumb, but you don't have to marry it. Keep your options open. Now, another nice trick when you're looking for largest and smallest values in proc univariate is the ID statement. The ID command, right, will actually show us, um, if we specify a variable name, it'll show us which observations correspond to which values. So, right, there's the usual proc univariate. We're operating on the jackknife residuals. Here, I'm, I'm putting this ID statement, and then the variable I'm putting in there is name, name is serial. So check that out. Right here, the, it starts with the five smallest values. So puffed rice stands out, right, with a negative 2.6. That's nice, isn't it? Without that, without that ID statement, it would just say that negative 2.6 corresponds to observation 55. And yeah, sure, right? We're, we're SAS experts enough to go back to like a proc print, some kind of subsetting statement, and say, okay, well, what is observation 55? But how convenient is it to just have that as part of our output? And to be able to say, right, because if we tell like our nutritionists, oh yeah, observation 55 was flagged as being potentially problematic, they're gonna, what's the, what are they gonna say? They're gonna say, what's observation 55? So instead, it's nice to be able to just say to them very easily, oh, puffed rice looks like it might right, be off in some way. And then we can look at the largest values, right? So mucilix is kind of right around the border, right on that two-ish threshold, special K, a little bit over two, but wow, what the, cut the, Quaker oatmeal, 9.3, 9.3, whew, holy moly, that's a doozy, that's a doozy of an outlier, nine standard deviations? So, using the, 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 the criteria of two, we would flag four cereals as potential outliers. Puffed rice, mucilix, special K, Quaker oatmeal. Now of those three, or of those four, one of them really screams out to us, doesn't it? And the one that really screams out to us is that Quaker oatmeal.
All right, so that's residuals. Now, we're going to spend the next 10-ish slides talking about some other common ways to also look for outliers. We'll talk about three of them. One is graphically based or visually based, right? It's using box plots. This, this process of using box plots to find outliers is referred to as Tukey's method. Tukey um, is an incredibly, um, incredibly important and famous statistician. If you're not familiar with his work, might be entertaining to uh, read his Wikipedia page. It's a fun way to practice social distancing. Um, two other numeric ways are to look at something called the leverage. Remember, leverage was that H value, so we're going to talk about what that H value is and how it in and of itself could be a measurement of um, whether something is an outlier. And we're going to talk about something called Cook's distance. So box plots, right? Box plots, sometimes called box and whisker plots, right? These are like basic, um, basic descriptive uh, statistics plots. You should be familiar with what a box plot is. If not, right, get to Googling. Um, it should be one of the last things you talked about in Stat 511 as a review, but something you would cover in a very low level, basic introductory statistics class. It's like the graphical equivalent of like a mean or a median. Now, box plots can show a lot of things, but they're very good at showing outliers. And so, right, the way that SAS does it is this. So, right, remember the, the, the box itself represents the IQR. IQR stands for interquartile range. The interquartile range is the range, the difference between the third quartile, that's Q3, and the first quartile, that's Q1. Right, remember, subtraction is a distance operator. Q3 minus Q1 third quartile minus first quartile is the the distance between the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile that's the width of our box now this is this is kind of the metric that SAS uses so SAS defines two types of outliers uh, an outside outlier and a detached outlier. The detached outlier we might think of as an extreme outlier. So it labels it as outside. Again, just maybe like a normal outlier using the symbol O. If an observation is more than one and a half interquartile ranges beyond the box. And if it's even further than that, if, if, it's, if it's three or more interquartile ranges away, then it's this sort of extreme outlier that SAS refers to as detached and labels with the, with the asterisk. So we're gonna look, we're gonna look at a box plot in a little bit of our serial. And actually I'm, I'm doing this a little bit off the cuff, so I'm not even 100% sure I'm right about this, but we found four serials Right, that that were flagged by by looking at our residuals, having a absolute value, a residual's absolute value was more than two. My guess is that three of those will be labeled as outside, and one of those, our our Quaker oatmeal, will be labeled as detached. Does that make sense? We'll see if it's true in a few slides. You can generate this box plot using the plots command in proc univariate. Oh, I take it back. Here it is. Um, eh, it looks like I used that ASCII stuff, and for whatever reason, looks like the box plot kind of got messed up. I apologize for that. Um, but I still think this is enough to work with. So the plot command, um, it gives us actually a couple things. So it gives us the stem and leaf plot. That's what's all the way on the left. A stem and leaf plot is um, a stem and leaf plot is like a histogram. Imagine if you pivot that thing, it looks like a histogram. The histogram actually looks really normal, doesn't it? It's got a nice normal shape to it. All the observations are bunched up on the bottom. Now, notice if you look at the very, very top of that stem and leaf plot, you see a 9. 
and then next to that nine you see the three that's our observation 9.3 right that's our quaker oats and if you look all the way over to the right where it says box plot notice as we expected that observation is marked with an asterisk Then, right, we can look along that axis and look at all the others. So if we go down that stem and leaf, we go 9, 8, 7, 6, we get to the 2. Do you see it says 2, and then it's got a 2 and a 2? That's basically saying that there's two observations that had a residual of 2.2. Right, if you go all the way out, there's that number 2. It's saying that there were two observations that fell into this category. And then notice there's that O. That O is saying that this was that outside outlier. Again, as we expected. Notice it also, so here we have a 1.9. Notice that's also flagged as an O. So using this process, we have one extra outlier beyond what we would have had if we used just the residual process. And then if we go all the way to the bottom, we see that negative 2.6. And we see that it's also flagged as an O. All right. I apologize for that broken box plot, but I mean, not a big deal, right? I mean, right, we are we are practicing statisticians, not armchair statisticians. So pull up any data set, right, of which you have access to by this point dozens if not hundreds and run this proc univariate with a plot statement yourself and you'll be able to see what this uh what this thing should look like. Yeah, sorry for that. It was fine before. I guess at some point in the process of this narration I don't know, messed that thing up. I apologize. All right, so that's the, the box plot process. So uh, so check. Only two more things for us to talk about, uh, leverage and Cook's distance. So leverage, leverage is that H value. So finally, what is this enigmatic H? This enigmatic H is actually a measure of the extremeness of an observation with respect to its independent variables, that is its X variables. Right, so what it basically does is it looks at like, again, right, it's it's a little tricky because we're talking about, right, if we have, if we have K, <coughs> uh-oh, excuse me. <coughs> if we have K of these X variables, then we're working in this like k-dimensional space. And we can't visualize it, but there still are mathematical processes for measuring distance between quote points in k-dimensional space. So imagine, right, we have all these observations. Each observation is this point floating around in k-dimensional space. In, in the sort of middle of this cluster of points, we have what's called the centroid. The centroid is, again, it's the middle of this cluster, right? And not surprisingly, it's defined as the mean of the first variable and the sample mean of the second and the sample mean of the third. So that's, that's that, that, that collection of sample means falls right in the middle of the cluster of points and then for any particular point, its leverage is, is its distance from that point to the centroid, right? So, so observations that have large leverages means they're extreme with respect to their X variables. That is, they are far, they are far from, right, the averages of these X values. Now, again, I said it's the scale distance, not the actual distance. Um, I, I think it actually is maybe scaled in such a way that it's between zero and one. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, again, it's not the raw distance. So we could actually show <coughs> that the average of all these leverages is... Um, <coughs> Oh dear, I apologize. <coughs> I know, very attractive. Um, 
the average i do assure you i i i'm covering my mouth with my the crook of my arm and sanitizing as we speak uh the average of all leverage values is k plus one remember k is our number of variables um over n oh yeah, yeah there we are and uh and and all of the uh leverages are between zero and one and the recommendation is to scrutinize any observation whose leverage is is essentially what it's essentially more than twice that average so more than two times k plus one over n so let's think about those formulas we had before for the studentized and jackknife residuals let's think about what happens when our leverage is really high all right here's the formulas so when our so there we are so our h goes between zero and one right notice as our h gets closer and closer and closer and closer to one what's happening to our to our studentized and jackknife residuals well as it's getting closer to one the denominator is getting smaller right one minus something close to one is is close to zero so the denominator is getting smaller which means the overall quantity is getting larger right that should hopefully make sense so what's kind of cool about these studentized jackknife residuals is they're measuring extremity not just in terms of y minus y hat but they're also at the same time measuring extremity in terms of our x variables right because uh, uh, if that if that leverage is really large it's it's kind of also at the same time inflating our studentized and jackknife residuals yeah pretty cool right all right last of the bunch so here's cook's distance cook's distance right which we can abbreviate with the letter d measures the extent to which estimates of the regression terms change when an observation is deleted from the analysis because of this it's used as a measurement of the influence right or impact of an observation we have we can see that that easy formula is like a nice computational formula just involves um just involves r's right remember r i believe was what we were using for the studentized residuals so that studentized residuals squared and you throw in some leverages and do a one over k plus one that's like a nice computational rule but a, a better maybe conceptual formula is the one above it so cook's distance does what it basically looks at the difference between right so those are all the different coefficients of our model and so it looks at our y-intercept that's the y-intercept using all of our observations it then calculates the the y-intercept using all observations except for that particular observation and it looks at the difference so it basically is saying right if i use or don't use this observation how much does that change the y-intercept if it changes the y-intercept a lot that means that this that it means that this observation is exerting a lot of influence on our model which might imply as we've talked about before that it's an outlier or right the term we might also use is that it's influential and then it does it again for all the other coefficients in our model and it kind of aggregates these squared differences right we're squaring them so positive and negative distances don't cancel each other out and a, a pretty widely held convention is right anytime we have a cook's distance more than one that's a red flag that maybe we should look a little deeper so again right we have all these we have all these rules now right we have a residual process for finding problematic or potentially problematic observations for raising red flags we have a box plot process for raising red flags a leverage process and a cook's distance what do we do if something has a red flag 
Well, we should check if it's a data entry error. If it is, we should fix it. We should check if it's part of our intended population. If it's not, we should get rid of it. But if none of those are true, we generally keep it in our data set. All right, we're almost done. And we're getting close to that one hour mark. So here we are, right, proc reg. Um, I'm outputting a couple extra things now. So cook D is the keyword to output cook's distance. H, not surprisingly, is, excuse me, the keyword to output leverage. So now, right, we gotta find like all these problematic values using all these different criteria. Here for this, for this thing, I'm focusing on cook. So I'm sorting these in a descending fashion by cooks. Remember, I could also actually use proc univariate. It's another way of doing it. Um, maybe even a more effective way of doing it. Then I do a proc print by these new sorted observations. And we'll take a look. But before we do, let's remember what our red flags are. Our red flags are any jackknife residual with an absolute value more than two. We've actually already checked all those. A cook's distance more than one. And a leverage more than two times K plus one over N. So, right, we remember we had three variables, whatever it was. Was it carbohydrates, sugar, and fat maybe were our three variables? We had 77 cereals. So that gives us eight over 77, so about 0 0.10. So we have one and 0.1, looks like. And there's our output. So it's sorted by Cook's distance. So what do we see? We see that using Cook's distance, the only thing that gets flagged is Quaker oatmeal. And again, Quaker oatmeal is, is really well beyond like that threshold of one. So it looks like the only thing we would flag using the Cook's process is Quaker oatmeal. Um, we're looking at leverages. Now this one's a little tricky because again, probably in, in practice what we should do is we should now proc sort by leverage because these are not sorted by leverage. Now notice sorting them by cooks does seem to mostly sort them by leverage, but if you look down that leverage column, you will see that they're not perfectly sorted. That said, we can still see that Quaker oatmeal has a leverage of 0.32, which again is beyond the 0.10 threshold. Also 100% natural bran has a pretty high leverage, doesn't it? So notice it gets flagged by the leverage, but natural brand is not flagged by the jackknife. So again, different processes can catch things that other processes may not. That means that this is maybe not that extreme in terms of observed minus predicted, but that natural brand maybe is extreme in terms of its carbs and sugar and fat. And then it looks like what? It looks like all brand with extra fiber has a 0.126, so it's a little bit above the 0.10 threshold. And then we can kind of look down the line again, probably the better process would be to, to proc sort by leverage. Then it would be very easy to see what's above 0.10. We could actually also, maybe this would be the better way, we could subset our data set, couldn't we? <clears throat> Just do something like if leverage greater than 0.104. So that's a, a, an additional way of, of kind of catching all the cereals that have a high leverage. And there we are. So maybe one last thing that's not explicit in the PowerPoints is like, okay, so so like what do I do? Like do I use all of these processes, one of these processes? Um if I if I were to use all of the processes, do I check Every observation flagged by every process. That's a lot of work, but it's thorough, right? Or maybe I only check observations that are red flagged by all, all four, or maybe three out of four of the processes. That's less thorough. Well, there's not really a black and white answer to that question. Um, on a take-home test, on a homework assignment, 
I would say that I want you to um, at least flag any observation that's flagged by any one of these four processes, any one of these four approaches. In practice, that might be cumbersome, right? That is like in a classroom, we try to instill like these idea of best practices that may or may not be compatible in the workplace, right? The workplace, you have a whole other slew of competing responsibilities. You have a boss who's demanding a certain volume or velocity of output. You have colleagues that are waiting on you to get them results so that they can sort of do their part of the process. <laughs> feel like I'm talking about the Sixers. I, I, I keep saying the process over and over again. Um, we're kind of like our own version of the Sixers, I guess, here in 512. Um, yeah, especially since they're not playing right now. Anyways, um, that's for you to reconcile when you get to the workplace. That's between you and God and I guess your boss and colleagues as to kind of finding that balance between very thorough statistics and like the time crunch of the workplace, finding that balance of like, I know it would be great for me to do all these things. I maybe don't have the time to do them all. So I have to figure out which ones are the important ones. But in our classroom, I want you to kind of do them all. And you'll find, I mean, the more you practice it, the less time it takes, right? So again, it's gonna feel laborious and time consuming at first, Anything that's new to us feels laborious and time consuming, but as you're forced, right, by say a cruel but well-meaning professor to do it over and over and over again, the more secondhand it will become, the easier and the faster and the less laborious it becomes. Now, the, the, the nice takeaway from this set of slides is what, right? A lot of our fl red flags were kind of long, along the thresholds, the one that was flagged over and over and over extremely was that Quaker oatmeal. So that's telling us what? It's telling us we should look at that observation. It turns out if we look at that observation, it has a sugar content of negative one. Now, I'm not a nutritionist, but I'm pretty confident that's not a possible value. In this case, it would be easy to find the correct value, wouldn't it? We would just go to our local uh, giant or Acme and just go to the Quaker oatmeal section and just read it off the box. So we could fix that relatively easily. And, right, realistically, this is something that we should have caught before we even got to this stage, agreed? Because that process that I described in the previous set of slides, if we had just run proc means, on that sugar variable, we would have seen that the sugar variable has a minimum of negative one, and that would have immediately indicated to us, hey, there's some sort of typo in my data set. So ideally, we would have caught that and fixed it before we even got to the model building phase that said, I think it's nice to go through a kind of model building process with this negative one in so we can kind of see how it shows up as an outlier and so forth. All right, so we did 20 slides in our first set, 30 slides in our second set. We've done a little over 50 slides. We still got more than 50 slides to go. Whew. Why don't we go uh, carb load or something? And then at some point later, come back and uh, I'll try to have another slide ready for you.